Great. Well, welcome. And it's great to be here. My name is Kathy, and I was city manager in the city of Sonoma in the 2017 fires, which is my fire experience. Now David has my job, thankfully. Um, so I'm now a consultant, and pleasure to be here. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about the new normal of wildfires. And the reality is that there's no normal about the recovery. There's a road that you follow, and there's steps you have to take. But every community is different geographically, culturally, physically, economically. All of those things affect the recovery. So in front of you today are three different folks who are going to talk about three California fires. Um, I'm going to ask each of them to introduce themselves. And when they are, also tell, give you a little context about their fire and a little, you know, but what, what the fire was, you have some sense of it, and also where recovery is now when they introduce themselves. So we're just going to take three minutes, and then we're going to come back, and I'll ask some questions. So David, I'm going to start with you, because we're going to go chronological order here. David. Great, thank you. Um, I'm David Guin. I'm currently the city manager of City of Sonoma, and at the time in 2017, I was the planning director and assistant city manager for the city of Santa Rosa. Um, during the 2017 Tubbs fire. And the Tubbs fire was, uh, at the time, the most destructive fire in California history. Um, 36,000 acres uh, burned. We lost 22, uh, of our 22 people in that fire and 5,600 homes um, in that fire. And so it was, uh, came over from Napa and I mean, it devastated a lot of Sonoma County, um, a lot of the urban areas more than we expected. Um, and so that was uh, a lot of our, our, our issue. And currently, the current status is that the uh, majority of the housing is rebuilt, um, and a lot of new things have happened, um, and an outcome of that process, um, both policy, development, um, approaches, and resilience to future fires. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Dave Reed. I'm the director of the Office of Response, Recovery, and Resilience at the County of Santa Cruz. Um, our fire in 2020 was part of the lightning complex fires that hit most of Northern California. Um, our fire burned about 86,000 acres between our county and San Mateo County. Um, our community lost about 900 homes across about 750 parcels. Um, and from a recovery standpoint, and I'll get into this in the, in the question portion, but um, our recovery isn't necessarily where we want it to be. Um, we probably had about 200 of those 750 properties sell, and we've had probably about a third of the total number enter into the rebuilding process in one shape or m another. So it's been a challenge, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Great. Good afternoon, everybody. Kevin Goss, Plumas County Supervisor for District 2 in, in uh, Plumas County there. Uh, representing the Greenville Indian Valley area and um, our fire was the Dixie fire the uh, largest single most wildfire uh, in the state of California or in the United States um, burned 900 homes uh, in the communities of uh, Greenville Warner Valley Indian Falls Canyon Dam and um, currently um, it has been a challenge uh, in Greenville proper. Uh, we just had DT, T, T, DTSC, Department of Toxic Substances, there for uh, about a year and a half removing ex ex excess lead that was discovered after uh, Cal OES uh, came through and did their initial cleanup. So we did, uh, we had what was called Zone X and they uh, scraped all those lots again and covered them back up with uh, 18 inches of soil. And so that's kind of set us back on our rebuild. Um, we are moving pretty quickly for uh, a town of our size, and we have definitely had challenges, but uh, I think we are uh, farther along than most and have learned uh, quite a bit uh, about through the process and definitely be happy to discuss that later. So, thank you. Great, thanks, Evan. All right, I'm gonna start with some questions and and David, I'm going to ask you to start. The first question is really, what were the key recovery challenges for Santa Rosa? Uh, I'll, I'll frame it in the three Ps, uh, people, pro uh, processes, and um, uh, persistence. <laughs> and now when I talk about people, uh, the people that are in the EOC after the fire hits, and you, everyone's called in are your staff. It's the, it's the people that are working on all the, the, the work of getting the city government done. 
Um, those are your EOC representatives. They're also responding to their personal losses. You just heard of people up here on the panel that lost their homes while they were trying to serve the community that happened uh, throughout the county. Um, and then you have those end of same individuals that need to be recovering, rebuilding, come thinking of, um, five years ahead, 10 years ahead, and also coming up with future plans. And so that, that was a big challenge. Um, and we, 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 we had a lot of burnout. Um, we were working people 24 hour, 24, 24 hour shifts, uh, writing policy at night, reviewing the policy during the day with the attorneys and approving policies. It was just a nonstop process. And so it was a lot of burnout that happened. Um, the processes, um, being, being, being bold, trying new things, because a lot of stuff, we didn't have a playbook. We were just making it up as we went along. This was kind of one of the first ones in 2017 that was this big. Um, how do we rebuild 57, 5,600 homes and then not get five years later and be back where we were housing numbers in 2017? That would have been a disaster, um, another disaster in terms of a housing stock. So trying to figure out how to rebuild but build new housing at the same time and walk and chew gum was the common phrase that was used over and over and over again. So that was a challenge. Um, and, the, and then uh, per, um, persistence, just being persistent with everything, uh, with, with moving things forward and hitting walls and trying to get over them and figure it out. Um, and we can talk about some of those uh, specific things as, as we go along. Yeah, so, so for Santa Cruz County, for those of you not familiar, it's about two hours south of here. It's the second smallest county in, in the state. Um, we were the epicenter of the 1989 earthquake um, that rocked the whole Bay Area. So for us, the biggest challenge has been the topographic and geologic diversity of our burn scar. Um, and how hard it is to rebuild in, in California in general, and some of our building code, and we talked about building code earlier in the day, some of those building code floors around geotechnical engineering requirements um, creates, created a huge barrier because these aren't flat lots in Coffee Park. Um, these are topographically diverse lots. Um, many of them were 1930s and 40s cabins that were vacation homes to San Franciscans um, back in the turn of the century that became permanent homes for residents. So they had substandard septic systems, they had you know, inadequate water systems. Um, and so all of those challenges, right, just to get to the place where you're pouring a foundation was a huge hurdle for a lot of folks, obviously speaking from a, a, a deeply underinsured standpoint as well. So those are, those are um, some of the challenges, lots more as well, but, but I'll, I'll stop there in the interest of sharing. You bet. Uh, I touch. You know, I can um, assimilate with both of all of your comments. Uh, also for Plumas County, um, some of our obviously our biggest challenge was the uh, DTSC and the extra lead in the soil. But uh, our uh, low to uh, moderate income folks, underinsured, um, not insured at all, uh, looking to um, get back on the ground. And I think our recovery really took off running because literally things were still smoking when we were figuring out the Dixie Fire Collaborative and how we were gonna move forward. And we were so lucky that we had so many good community members that knew how to take the ball and run with it and, um, and get after us at the county to um, start looking into uh, enacting a Title 25 type of uh, situation, which uh, for Plumas County was a Title 8. Um, and um, taking away some of those other things like fire sprinklers and, and solar panels to make things a little more affordable for folks. And that is uh, uh, proving to, we're just now enacting that two years later, uh, but it is still uh, helping uh, folks all over the place and, and really managing uh, our FEMA dollars and going after those uh, big monies uh, to bring those housing stock of, I think, I think we're going to be able to build 40 homes with our CBDGDR money uh, for low to moderate income folks who prior to the fire may have been renters and now they'll be homeowners. So. Some silver lining. Dave, I'm going to start with David Reed. David, can you talk a little bit about what are some of the policy ideas or initiatives that you did internally to like streamline the recovery process for homeowners? Well, as 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 the other David had mentioned, um, they were kind of first in line in the process. So we first met with Sonoma County and Santa Rosa um, to talk about their process. What we tried to do was build a a recovery permit center similar to what the city and the county of Sonoma did. Um, and we also built a clearance process. So our, our damage was rural, so no infrastructure, um, you know, not a lot of community infrastructure. So everybody has their own well, their own septic system, and they need fire access. So we created a clearance process. So if you 
took care of those three things, if you, if you met a, low, a medium bar on those three things, then we could expedite the review of your process and your permit and turn it around in that seven to 10 day period. So those are critical pieces um, to getting you know, folks to, to be able to rebuild or at least start to get the consultants and the consultant teams that they needed in place to move forward. So it's, it's not perfect, um, I will say. Um, the consultant communities in, our, in, in California have standards that they don't wanna dip below. So things like waiving and changing code requirements was a non-starter for our consultant community, and therefore that drove some of the costs up for us. Let's go ahead and build on him. I'll just build on that. Yeah. So as uh, we, we we everything changed, we just we changed every policy. Um, but the thing that led this was the fact that the day before the fires, we were dealing with developers, seasoned professionals, um, people that build houses and subdivisions all, all, all day long. Um, the next day, we were dealing with 5,600 5, people that were just you know watching TV the night before on their couch, and now they're a developer and having to figure this out. So we changed our entire process to facilitate that, and that was that was our customer. That's who we were talking to. All of our outreach materials, we created the rebuild center um, overnight. Basically, took a whole building in town in our in our, in our complex, um, put up a big thing, and and said we're going to turn plans around in five days and just make it happen. And so we pulled in a bunch of a bunch of resources. Uh, made everything as simple as possible, um, streamlined processes. Um, basically, I had three direction to my staff was three things. One, if you make a decision, make it and move on. Two, if you need my, my approval, come see me immediately. We'll make the approval and get it done. If you have to go to council, let me know, and I'll get it on the next council agenda or call a special meeting. But we, we have to keep moving. And so that was the process. It was just nonstop because as a homeowner, they had to deal with us. They had to deal with the developer. They had to deal with the, all these various regulatory agencies, and we wanted to help that process. And the insurance thing's interesting, or the, the, the code thing's interesting. That was one example of, we found out right away that um, people were hitting into their insurance companies about um, code requirements. So the first thing we did is ran out there and said, look, here's, here's, every, here's the, the age of homes that were, were destroyed. We had that information. Um, came up with a list of all the code changes that happened from that date to where we were today. Gave that to the um, insurance company. They said, fine, this works great. Wrote them a check and gave them the money. So it just streamlined that process for everybody. So trying to find those little things, those those hiccups, those barriers, and just finding a way to bust through it because um, there's plenty more coming <laughs> as along the way. Kevin, maybe just a follow-up question. I won't go to you. One of the things I think is interesting, a story I've heard you talk about is that like the culture of building that entrepreneurial culture is really what you are what you have to do in one of these recoveries. And you all did a meeting every single day made decisions and but there was very, you know there's strategy and then there's internal culture which drive things can you yeah. just speak to that a little sure, bit sure absolutely yeah the culture was right off the bat the first thing i basically told my staff is there's three things one is get to yes you have to figure out how to get to an answer and get to a yes two was try it. if it doesn't work fix it try it again just keep iterating just keep trying because there's you're, it's not going to be perfect the first time and third was remember there's humans involved in, in in this process so these are individuals people at home that are not not doing this every day like i talked about before so a whole other level of compassion has to come into the process and what we do in terms of timing, in terms of how we talk, in terms of how we're, you know, our bureaucratic minds typically work. So that was a daily conversation and making decisions daily. And the council, to their credit, I went in front of the council and said, this is the way it's going to be. we got to do it this way. And the council backed us 100%. So I said, I'm not going to get it right. We're going to try it. Um, I'm going to come back to you and say, whoops, that didn't quite work. we got to fix this code. And they said, great, let's just do that. And never once did they say, why did you mess up? And I think that's really important for all of us is to, you know, be compassionate among, <laughs> through the whole process because we're all everyone's trying to figure it out. So, thank, thank you, David. That elaboration, please. You bet. So yeah, up in Plumas County, we have a we don't have a 12 month building season. We have a six to eight month uh, building season with the winters that we have. So we needed to right off the bat, we needed to know we need to get streamlined in our building department through our permitting process. And uh, all of that also, um, we needed to get people housed uh, right after the fire, winter's coming, people are sleeping in tents. Uh, we streamlined the process to be able to get um, uh, a, a um, RV uh, park up to snuff with uh, power water sewer uh, to house these folks uh, through the winter, uh, which proved to uh, really help keep them in our community. And uh, for, unfortunately, our FEMA trailers ended up in Westwood in Lassen County. Uh, which was uh, um, something that uh, we will uh, be talking about. <laughs> but uh, when you put them up in Westwood where they get to average snowfall of six feet on, on a trailer, it uh, doesn't work out too well. So 
we streamline a lot of policies. Uh, we're still streamlining two years later. We're still working on it, still refining it, and uh, moving forward for sure. Kevin, maybe maybe not right now, but I'd like you at some point to talk about wearing your elected official hat because Dave, the Davids are staffers. So you have this unique role of being a local elected. So any insights there about what is it what is it like in that role and any advice you have for folks in this super important challenge? Wow, okay, well, uh, 12 years ago, I didn't think, I, when I was elected supervisor, I didn't think I was gonna be having to handle uh, a, a wildfire recovery uh, effort, but uh, in my periphery there, it was definitely, uh, uh, I could see it all around uh, Plumas, or all around the state that things like this were happening, and uh, I think that uh, the biggest thing for me was uh, making sure that we surrounded ourselves at the county with all of our community. We have a very resilient community, as do all of these communities that go through this, and making sure that uh, we're communicating uh, at the uh, elected level, at the county level, with the folks from the D Dixie Fire Collaborative, with uh, Nancy Presser and folks and all of our DCMs, DeCaster, disaster case managers and um, having that communication and making sure that all of our constituents uh, uh, needs are getting met and getting to the yes part as uh, David was uh, describing is was huge but uh, again you can't prepare um, but what if I can say to other elected officials and other community members and, and staffers is and if you haven't had a wildfire right now is the time to start preparing for it you need to know how fema works you need to know how cal oes works and you need to know all of those things prior to your event and unfortunately i'm sad to say that there will be more obviously but uh, if you have those tools in your chest and your your community members your uh, lead community members your chambers uh, all of that are well aware of how the county operates because let me tell you a lot of folks out there in constituency land have an absolutely no clue how a county operates. And uh, when it comes to disaster time, it's too late to try and figure it out. But uh, we, uh, we are working through that, and I think that's one of the biggest things I could put forward. Great, thank you. Um, David Reed, can you talk to us about like um, the advice and how did you navigate governance issues with the different layers of government that is involved in a recovery? Yeah, so there's a lot of ways in which I thought about that question, and and I want to focus kind of on the from a rebuilding lens. Um, and so for us as a county, we're subject to in the septic environment our water board, our state water board for the regulatory framework. So that framework is the floor in which which all of the septic requirements are there. Um, on top of that, as I said before, the building code piece the California Building Code requires the geotechnical engineering piece. We have a very geologically diverse county, so the geologic requirements in our community are very complex as well. So one of the things that we recognize in navigating all that stuff is, as, as David said, folks went from, from being homeowners, many of them living in a rural environment, not necessarily wanting to live in a rural environment, but living there because it was the only affordable place they could live. So they're not developers. They did not build their house by themselves. They moved into that house that may have been 60 years old and they didn't understand all of those layers. So part of it is an education process for community in terms of understanding all of those layers. They wanna build back the same way they had before. And again, from a building code standpoint and as we've discussed in the first part of the day, we need to build back better. We need to build back more resilient um, but when you don't have the insurance monies to do that, it's very stressful on the elected officials, stressful on the staff to support that. So it's a communication to, to the community members on all of those regulatory frameworks and the limitations that local government sometimes has, right? Our community members want us to remove all barriers and sometimes we don't have the regulatory authority to remove all barriers. So the very least that we can do is explain those try and find ways in which we can streamline or simplify that message or simplify the process. Um, but we can't make all of those things go away, even though community wants us to, even though financially they need us to, there's still some base limitations. So it's really about communicating and educating. And the one thing I would build off of, of um, that, that has been said, right, is that we, we as government spin things up quickly 
but we all know here that the recovery process takes a really long time and you have to repeat the message in the communication of process again and again and again and it has to be not just in the first six months it has to be in the first 18 months 24 months because for us it took nine months to a year just to get all of the debris removed, right? So nobody could even get back onto their land with a consultant to begin the evaluation of what was needed to rebuild for over a year. So we had things spun up because of the lessons learned of our community around us, but people need to hear it multiple times again and again and again. Um, yeah, so the governance question is an interesting one. I'll, I'll maybe start more grassroots in that it, we, we quickly found with 5,600 homes lost, there were different communities. There was um, kind of flat areas, hill areas, um, other areas. So neighborhood groups formed um, Coffee Strong. You may may have heard of those. So groups, uh, neighborhood groups were very powerful in the process. They helped drive kind of what's needed in the priority of, of what was going on. We thought we knew we had a good Sense, sense of what we knew needed to do, but as we started going along, we we kept going to these community meetings, and they said, "No, actually, this is the problem. This is the problem." Oh, great! So it helped it helped us determine where to focus our efforts and our time. So that kind of drove our governance model um, to then get to council or make those decisions and move forward. Um, I can talk all day long. I mean, somebody else is probably going to talk all day long about FEMA and um, Cal, Cal OS, and you know, that's I, I, I tend to want to stay where our local officials have the control to make those decisions because I think that's really key is to find where what the local city can do and and take it and do it right and take advantage of those those abilities and the council has that that authority and, and empower provide them the information so they can make those informed decisions um, what one one quick example was we were at the at parallel time we were looking at doing an all-electric policy so getting rid of natural gas um, so we, we didn't want to add that layer on top of people rebuilding that lost everything that their insurance companies are barely making it meet so the last thing we want to do is walk inside oh by the way you got to go all electric and put in induction stoves and do all this other stuff so um, what we did is the areas that burned we actually worked with a um, uh, Sonoma Clean Power, another organization, and they help fund um, anybody that wanted to go electric, they would make up that difference and put money towards it to help get them there. So to try to find those creative solutions to do exactly what, try to avoid what David was t talking about in terms of adding costs and ba barriers. So um, the, the, the governance model completely goes out the window in terms of it's not just government, it's nonprofits, it's the community groups, it's everybody comes together and that's kind of the, the new system that, that we found um, worked. and. Um, and it worked great and it even spun off future things. So during that process, we were thinking, how do we rebuild but then keep building new so that, like I said, five years later, we're, we're actually increasing our housing stock. And so in, in parallel to this, I worked with uh, some nonprofit groups and came, we came up with this Renewal Enterprise District concept of generating money to put into new high density housing downtown, you know, building housing in another part of town, right, to help offset what was lost and also why we're rebuilding. So um, it's just the, uh, I'll just keep reiterating the walk and chew gum approach um, to, to, to get through it. Thank you. Kevin, can you maybe talk about some of the governance issues that you've had to navigate up in Plumas County? <laughs> There's a lot. Um, I, governance uh, issues, let's see. I, I think the biggest one was uh, just to uh, David's uh, comments in regards to the education of our, our citizens because they, they wanted to come out uh, the gates blazing and they didn't want to deal with solar, they didn't want to deal with um, uh, all these other uh, regulations, they just wanted to come and start building and that just wasn't going to be the case. We, 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 we had to go through the original debris removal, half of that debris sat uh, through the winter and was having to be picked up in the spring. And, and they didn't understand why that couldn't happen. And then all the soils came back and, and tested uh, super high for lead and arsenic and, and whatnot. And so they didn't quite understand that. And our community meetings, our monthly community meetings that we started off right off the bat was that conduit that we used to be able to communicate to our community and have those kind of tough conversations with them and say, this is, this is gonna be our process. And you're not going to like it, but there's you know we, there's steps that we've got to take. We're going to try and spin this up as fast as we can. Don't get us wrong, but uh, here are some of the things that you can do now, right now, to be able to get your name at the front of the line when you walk into that permit center and and uh, submit your permit. So um, those were huge right off the bat. Um, just instilling in the community um, just some simple things that uh, we had just had our community revamped with a Caltrans project. But right after that, I went, went down and bought, uh, after the town was burnt, I bought 
I don't know, two, three truckloads of flowers and we put them in all these beds just to, to, to bring that uh, sense that we're, we're going we're gonna to come through this and we're going to be there. And just having that, the pulse on the community and make sure that uh, they're, they're feeling that their concerns are being heard. And um, that's about, you know, sticking, your, keeping your nose to the grindstone and everything will work out. Either David's, do you have any comment just on that community building? I mean, how do you, any tricks or techniques that you, you guys used or stories about really that community working closely with neighborhoods or individuals? Yeah, I guess I, I touched on a little bit with uh, Copy Strong and the organizations that formed and the community that was built around this. Obviously, everyone had a similar uh, situation that they were dealing with. Uh, that was really key. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, I, one of our roles we quickly found out was to help support that and not look at that as a, um, a hindrance or, oh gosh, I have to deal with that group now. It's another thing, but actually to embrace it. And we had staff go to every single meeting and show up at night, you know, just whatever it was, just be there, show up. And I think that, that meant a lot, I think, to a lot of people that the city was just there. You know, it's not, we were, weren't telling people what to do. We were listening, trying to understand what the issues were. I mean, they're trying to figure out how we could use our tools and governance structure to help get them through. So I think that really built a different relationship that we needed um, through that process. And I could, in the beginning, it was like, oh, what's, what's going on? We, we, leave us alone. We're, we're, we're rebuilding. But uh, that, that would that would have been horrible and disastrous. So. I was just going to say that, I mean, I think we we all in our communities, when you face disaster, there's a, there's a coalescing and, and community organizing around trying to be in that recovery spirit. I'd say one of the challenges for us um, was really the diversity of impacted community members and the challenge each individual property owner has in a rural community in a rural disaster with recovery. One neighbor to the next, literally across the street, may have different geologic constraints, septic constraints, or topographic constraints. So each person's journey was so individualized that it made it harder to coalesce around strategy to recover as much as it was just around being in a sense of community, which is important because it is such a traumatic experience to go through any disaster, but it was harder for us because so many neighbors had such different experiences um, in what they were required to do or needed to do to recover and rebuild. Just real quick to dovetail on that, I think engaging in the um, RSF process, the recovery support function process, and engaging the community in what those re sub, uh, recovery support functions and projects are going to look like is, was huge for us as well because we were having uh, engaging uh, community meetings and talking about these different projects and what the community wanted to see and and going forth uh, going forward and I think that really uh, sealed the deal on a lot of folks that hey we are moving forward and it just just that ball just has to keep rolling and if you start to s feel it slowing down you're feeling it slowing down and you need to step up and and and, and push it a little harder down the hill so great thank you I'm going to ask for them one last question, then we're going to open it up to any questions in the audience. So really, as you reflect back on your individual journey and the journey of your community, what are three tips that you would give to someone who's going to walk into your role in the next mega fire? Um, I mean, I think the, the thing that for me that resonates, and we've had two federally declared disasters in 2023 that were floods. Um, is really understanding your disaster, understanding what that recovery arc looks like, um, and being able to communicate that early, right? So that timeline for fire recovery is much different than flood recovery, right? You need to be instantaneous in, in mucking out a flooded home, whereas you've got months of, re of rebuild um, or re debris removal before you can start that rebuild with fire. The other pieces is really just that time and trauma piece. I think as government, we're not seen as having a heart uh, all the time, and we need to recognize that we are dealing with people in a trauma-informed space, and we need to be compassionate, empathetic, and patient, and we need to be recognize that it takes time for people to integrate information when they're coming from a trauma-informed space, and we need to be able to be comfortable with reiterating our story, reiterating our process, working through challenges, trying to remove barriers as much as we can. Um, I would say just like I said earlier, make sure that you are prepped and ready uh, prior to the fire and your your community understands 
uh, what if they were to have a tabletop you know, type of an exercise, if you were to have a, a disaster of this case or uh, scenario, what would that look like? And what what uh, what can what can your local government do? What can they not do? Um, and engage in that way. Fully immerse yourself right after the disaster. Immerse yourself and get yourself boots on the ground. Be on the ground out there. Your constituents need to see you out there doing things and and making sure that uh, their their needs are met. Um, and then just, you know, the, the traumatic part of it, you know, I, I'll say that, you know, we are kind of looked upon as uh, no heart or anything, but I'll tell you, uh, I lost my business in the middle of this fire and disaster, and I have a heart, and I have trauma, and I have stuff, and so recognizing that the people that are that are um, up here uh, that are working for you in government also have hearts, and they are doing the best that they possibly can, and so recognizing that, uh, is huge as well. Well, these are, these are, I'll echo both of what they said, excellent points. Um, I'll, I'll re reiterate something that David brought up earlier is, is, is learn from others. I mean, I mean, we're all going through this. We all learn something along the way. It keeps getting better and better. Um, we, we didn't have too much to look back on when we had ours. And so we actually brought in the former city manager of San Bruno, who had the gas explosion back in, I forgot what year it was, but that was the closest thing we could find as a fire disaster that we could try to get some information from. And so we took little pieces from it. And it wasn't, it wasn't the exact copy cut, cut cutter, but it was something, you know, and it's just, and then you can build off it. So definitely reach out, ask where everyone's willing to help and support organizations like this as well, obviously. Um, and then I obviously the, the remembering all the people involved, the, the citizens that are going through this and all the, the, the nonprofits that are working hours. You just heard from the med the, the medical uh, industry that was, you know, her heroic during that time and trying to figure all this out and manage all these different facilities. Um, and then you have the staff that's just, you know, trying to figure it out and then give yourself time to think long term because it's easy to get lost in the, the day. Um, but oh, like somebody has got to be thinking what's happening five, 10 years from now and what's this, what, what are we going to be doing and what do we need to put in place now? What policies can we start changing and take advantage of it, not take advantage of it, but use that opportunity to do things, push the boundaries. Like we, back then we, we, we started changing our ADU policies before the state did it. And, uh, basically when we did rebuild, people said, Oh, I'm going to put ADU and I can do it. It's cheap. They wait, they waive the fees, they waive the parking requirements, they waived all this stuff. And so we actually ended up with more units in coffee park than we lost, um, after it was rebuilt because of the number of ADUs that were added in those things. And the state ultimately took a lot of that and made that into state law. So I'm sorry, or you're welcome, depending on how you feel about that. Um, but I think you know, it was, you know, those are the things that you can do and push push the envelope a little bit and try change processes for the better that will be long lasting for for the future. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your service and all of the expertise. Any questions of the public? Right in the middle there. Go ahead. All right. Three to five ways you're communicating to the public right after a burn. I mean, right after the key piece, right, is to get people engaged in the FEMA IA process and then build that relationship and have that muscle of the long-term recovery group that builds your disaster case management arm that is the long-standing piece. But that gives you that conduit into all those folks that were impacted is one key way that we've worked. One of the other key ways, which is just basically boots on the ground with a, a call center team and taking those numbers and cold calling until you get a hold of somebody because there's, you know, you can go through the FEMA IA process and we what we discovered is there's a lot of people up there that don't want to go through the FEMA IA process for whatever reason. <laughs> And they they don't want to be reached by government. We're not, we're not going. We don't want to say, hey, government, we're, we're the government. We're here to help. No, they don't want that. And so um, they're um, just the, the 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 cold calling. Let uh, Sue Weber and all of the the folks at the Dixie Fire Collaborative did right off the bat was huge. And we, you know, because we were so scattered, uh, you know, everybody just went everywhere. And we knew that the key to our recovery was to get a hold of those folks, find out where they are, what their needs are. And so that they, we have the better chance of repopulating our town to at least 50% or more of what uh, it was prior. And we were, we were more in an urban setting, so we did hold massive talent. We, we got a hold of the schools, held big town hall meetings and huge auditoriums, and they were standing room only, packed. People just wanted information. I mean, people were just craving information. So it was trying to find spaces big enough to hold these meetings to talk about what was going on and the latest information. Um, and then obviously all the right the kind of just walking around through the, um, the assistance um, centers and setting those up quickly. Um, and then also doing satellite uh, little areas that people can go to um, and events to try to, to, to try to make contact. Um, 
through the rebuild process is kind of what you're talking about. Of, of, oh, for preparedness, yeah. I think well, from an from what we're doing mostly is just uh, the typical electronic uh, town hall mailers. Uh, we, we try to do at least three methods of communication, which is you know electronic website mailers, whatever way we can do radios. Utilize your local radio station. Utilize um, they, they tend to be the most effective way to get the, the voice out there, and, and the newspaper obviously. Any other questions? Yeah, I mean, so I spent eight years working for a county supervisor, and, and you have a, a county supervisor here can ar articulate as well, but I do think, and there was a meeting we had earlier, I think there's a, there, your voice needs to be amplified, right? And the most effective way to amplify your voice if the elected officials are not there for you is through your through different media outlets or through different resources because that type of a treatment where where they don't even recognize that it's going to take much longer than a year that simple thing of fee waiver for, for a longer period of time, that seems like a very simple thing to do. And if your elected officials are not representing your community well, you need to amplify that politically to put a little bit of heat, um, no pun intended, on them. Agreed 100%. Which county is that? Nevada and Placer. Okay, Nevada and Placer. I know a few guys, so I'll have a few people, so I'll, I'll be giving them a call. All right, I think it's our time. Thank you very much. Thank you, panel.